Tēnā koutou katoa. Good morning and slama pagi. I'm Gregor Byrne from the University of Canterbury and I've been asked this morning to talk to you about uh, trends in speech perception testing. What I'd like to focus on are the ways in which we can make the tests that we deliver in speech audiometry more rapid, more accessible and more equitable. So speech perception testing is a major research interest of mine. Um, I've developed several um, speech tests, both in New Zealand English, Te Reo Māori, and also with the help of Dr. Saifu Jamaluddin in the Malay language. Um, but in recent years, there have been numerous advancements that have been aimed at making speech perception testing more rapid, more accessible and more equitable. So when we say rapid, essentially it's ways in which we can decrease the amount of time that's required for a speech test. And one of the ways in which we can do that is to increase the amount of information we get from each test. Um, if we can get more information from a single test, we don't have to repeat it multiple times in multiple different ways. What do we mean when we say we want to make a test more accessible? Essentially, we're trying to remove those barriers to the availability of speech testing. Um, and part of that can be to do with the cost of the test. Um, that also uh, counts as an, an, an equity issue. Uh, if we can make a test more affordable, then it's available to more of the population and that reduces the inequities that we have in, uh, in health provision. Um, and another way we can make tests more suitable is to improve the suitability of the test and the test material to the test participants. So um, most of the tests that uh, we have developed form part of a single software package called the UCAST, the University of Canterbury Adaptive Speech Test Platform. And you can see the various uh, buttons here representing the different modes of delivery of a, new, a number of different tests that we've developed. So the UCAST FW is an adaptive filtered words speech test for the diagnosis of auditory processing disorders. The digit triplet test, um, as many of you will know, is a hearing screening test, which uses numbers in noise. And the auditory visual matrix sentence test is a sentence in noise test that can be uh, delivered for diagnostic speech audiometry purposes in a number of different formats. And you'll hear more about those from, uh, from Seifel and from Azza uh, in the next day or two. Okay, but first what I want to do is focus on the matrix sentence test uh, and the ways in which we can um, improve the suitability of that test material for the people who are taking the test. So we know that speech recognition measures are a fundamental component of the audiometric test battery and they provide valuable information regarding the, the functional impact of hearing impairment on an individual's communication difficulties and it gives us information that isn't relayed by the audiogram. So an audiogram itself gives some clues as to the way someone will perceive speech. But in a lot of cases, there's a quite a poor, um, poor correlation between the, the pure tone audiogram and how someone performs in a real world environment, in, in a noisy environment, for example. So we developed the University of Canterbury Auditory Visual Matrix Sentence Test in New Zealand English. That's another key thing is we need to develop these tests in the language of the people who are taking the test and the accents. Um, and was with the goal of um, giving us an accurate portrayal of the communication difficulties that people encounter in real world scenarios. So just as a bit of background, um, matrix sentence tests were first developed by Hageman uh, for the Swedish language, and they consist of syntactically correct but semantically unpredictable sentences. So they're in the format of a name, a verb, a numeral, an adjective, and an object. So that's, that's the order. In English, obviously, in Malay, the adjective and the object are around the other way. And we've had versions created in multiple languages worldwide. Um, down the bottom here, you can see uh, Bahasa Malaysia, uh, which was um, that version of the test was developed by Dr. Saiful Jamaluddin as part of his PhD, and he'll be talking about that test a little bit later. I want to focus on the New Zealand English test for the moment. Um, this is what it looks like. So you can see we've got five columns here, and each column has 10 options for the particular word. Um, and you can put them together to form a sentence. Amy likes six old books. Oscar sees 12 good shirts. And so you can see those words get pieced together and they form a sentence. And because we've got five columns, each of which contains 10 options, uh, we've got 
10 to the power of 5 possibilities, which is 100,000 possible sentences. So we normalized this test for use in constant noise, which is noise which has the same uh, speech, uh, same spectrum as the underlying speech, babble noise, which is multi-talk babble, and also we normalized it in quiet so that you can uh, deliver that test uh, as, as just a standard um, speech and quiet test. The response modes that are available are in the open set response mode, which is where the participant hears the sentence and they just repeat back what they thought they heard, um, or the closed set mode where you actually select the options that, you're, um, th that you think you heard by pushing a button on a screen. So this is what the panel looks like from the software. Um, so you're presented actually with an array of 50 buttons that you can see here. And when you, as the, um, as the person taking the test, hear the sentence, you then just, using a touch screen, for example, push each button that corresponds to the word that you have heard. So um, let's give that a go. So that's Thomas likes three good books. So obviously I'm very familiar with this matrix um, and so I knew where to push those buttons. Um, but what we find is that people who are taking the test do require a little bit of practice. It usually takes about two practice lists for people to get the hang of where the test items are on the screen. So for the items that involve words, uh, we list them in alphabetical order, and the ones that involve numbers, we list them in numerical order, as you can see there. So that middle column there is in numerical order, all of the rest are in alphabetical order. But despite that, it may take a little bit of hunting. So if I, I find the word Thomas, um, I look down and there's likes, three, good. And then by the time I've gotten to the last word, I may have entirely forgotten what that final word was. The word books might have fallen out of my memory. Um, if I was just repeating it backwards in the open set mode, it might be a lot rap more rapid as I'm not having to hunt for those items on the screen. So obviously that, uh, my ability to perform that test doesn't just depend on my ability to perform speech perception in noise, but there's also the working memory and cognitive capabilities of finding these items on the screen and holding what we've heard in our working memory long enough for us to, to find all of those options and to push those buttons. So how demanding is that task? We want it to be able to be performed by people across the age range and the, it, it imposes different demands on different age groups. So obviously young children aren't going to do as well with this test because it is longer and because it uh, contains more words. So that just simply cognitively and where they are in their stages of language development, they may not be able to perform that test. Now, one, um, one thing that has often cropped up with people who are elderly performing this test is we find that their ability to perform such a test decreases with age due to cognitive and working memory demands. So the five word matrix sentence format, particularly in that closed set response mode, we find it works well with most adults, but it may impose significant cognitive demands on some participants, particularly children, but also the elderly. So how can we improve the suitability of tests like that? Um, one thing is that we have to take into account those effects for cognition and working memory. So we know that if we put hearing loss to one side, forget about your peripheral auditory sensitivity and the functioning of your cochlea, the ability to perceive speech in quiet doesn't really change all that much with age. Um, it's more a function of, of your, your hearing loss. But older listeners do have more difficulty perceiving speech in difficult listening conditions such as noise. Um, so that's, you can have two listeners with the same auditory configuration, but different ages, and the one that is older may have um, more difficulty perceiving speech in noise. So when we're applying speech tests for audiological purposes, we have to think about why we're doing it. What is, what's the purpose of this test? Usually we're, we're using it as a proxy for uh, peripheral hearing sensitivity, and we're not actually interested in those confounding factors such as cognition and working memory. We've got separate tests for those if we want to test those things specifically. So when we're doing speech audiometry, it's usually for the purposes of determining how well someone understands speech. And because working memory is highly correlated with language perception, particularly in adverse conditions, we should ensure that the test material that we're using is within the capability of the older clients that we're testing. 
So for this reason, in a number of different languages, simplified matrix tests have been uh, used. And these work by reducing the size of that 50 word matrix in order to reduce the cognitive and linguistic demands of the test. And they can be used for both children and for elderly clients. So previously these tests were released under the name of the, as, as a pediatric version of the test. And in most cases, um, they, that's what they are primarily used for. Some of them do that explicitly by use of picture pointing tests, for example. Um, but it has been found that these have been quite useful also for the elderly clients. So um, some example of simplified matrix sentence tests, we have the Oldenburger Kindersatz test, or Kisa. Now the word Kinder there means child, so it's explicitly saying it's a pediatric um, children's speech test. And what we do is we use three word pseudo sentences. So not full sentences, but just uh, a number, an adjective and an object. Uh, and that test has been validated for use with children over four years of age. So an example of um, a pseudo sentence that they use here is fünf weiße Blumen, which means uh, five white flowers. And other simplified uh, matrix tests have appeared in all sorts of European languages as well. So in Finnish, uh, French, Italian, and there are examples there. Um, the Polish one is slightly different. Um, it is, again, uh, if you're a child over seven, then they use a verbal response mode, but they've actually constructed the test so that they can use a picture pointing uh, method for children aged between three and six. And uh, Azza tomorrow will be telling you um, a bit more about the introduction, uh, sorry, giving you an introduction to the Malay pediatric sentence test um, that we've been uh, collaborating on together. Okay, so how did we create our New Zealand English matrix sentence test. Well, we took our five by 10 word matrix and took out firstly the first two columns. So we got rid of the names and the verbs that left us three columns. And then we reduced the number of options from having uh, 10 options for each to down to six options of each. So it's a, it, we ended up with a three by six matrix. Um, and when we chose those words, the way we did it was by prioritizing the words with a lower lexical difficulty. So they appear in children's vocabulary at an earlier age. Um, they had better slopes. And by that, I mean they are more um, suitable for in, in their psychometric properties for speech testing. Uh, and we also chose ones that required less editing because we not only did we choose the words based on the uh, existing adult matrix sentence test, but we used the same recordings. We were able to just slice up the recordings in a slightly different way to, to just isolate those three words. And so anything where there was a, a conjunction between the second word and the third word that made that difficult, um, we removed those items. And so this is what our, our matrix looks like in the end. So you can see example sentences um, might be two small hats, nine old shoes, for example. 10 old books, eight red spoons. And so with those uh, set of 18 words, um, we're able to get 216 possible pseudo sentences. So that's six to the power of three. And we identified um, which of those sentences were most suitable for being uh, incorporated into our test by evaluating the psychometric properties of 162 of those sentences. From that, we were able to generate a series of lists that had relatively similar performance between them. So we're trying to make them as homogenous as possible. And we did that using an iterative computer um, program to, uh, to maximize the homogeneity of the, the lists. So making sure they all had the same um, average SRT and also the same slope. So that's very important to ensure that they all behave similarly. So how does it look? Well, we evaluated these lists and uh, we did that with 43 normal hearing adult participants. So these are all young adults uh, with normal cognition and normal hearing. And what you can see is that their behavior is really quite um, homogenous. So this is in the open set um, test mode, and we found a mean speech reception threshold of minus 9.5 dB signal to noise ratio averaged across lists, uh, with um, a standard deviation of only 0.5 of a dB. And the mean slope was actually very high. It was around 15.5% per dB, which is, which is quite high. So if we compare this to the five word version, the adult version of the test, and not only is the standard deviation of the SRTs in both of those tests the same, but so are the slopes. And in fact, the uh, slope for the three word version is marginally better. 
When we look at the closed set response mode, uh, we get similar results. So here we've got um, the standard deviation of the SRT is very low. You can see those lists are, are pretty much overlying each other. It's only about 0.4 of a dB. Um, and the mean slope is 11.3 dB. And that corresponds, again, very favorably to the five word version of the test. So what this means is that these tests are not only suitable for use with adult clients, but they perform just as well as the ones with five words. Um, so uh, that has actually raised the question of us, do we need that five word version at all? Now there are other advantages to having five word sentences, and that is that it gives us more scorable items per sentence. And that increases the, uh, the speed with which we can arrive at a certain answer. So when we're performing this test in an adaptive mode, if we've got five words in every delivery, um, we can get a more precise estimate of the speech reception threshold in a shorter amount of time than if we're just using the three word version. So how do these advantages translate for use with children? So one of the things we wanted to look at was how the maturation of the auditory system and your vocabulary knowledge as you age, how does that affect your performance on this test? And what ages can we perform this test with? So we uh, examined the effect of age and maturation on the SNR thresholds in a number of normally hearing children in schools around Christchurch. So this was, we had 144 children aged between five and 13. Uh, and these are the results that we get. So here are the results from the ages of six to 12 in terms of the average speech reception threshold for a monaural stimulus delivery. And what you can see is that there is a steady increase uh, in the child's ability to do that test until they reach about age 10. And then from the ages 10 to 12, uh, we have a plateau of performance. So the child is, is, is improving in their ability to perform this test between six and uh, nine. And then once they reach 10, the, the results basically plateau at that point there. So to sum up, how can we ensure that the test material is suitable for an individual? First, we should be testing the people in the language that they are most familiar with. Um, because in adverse conditions, particularly in noise, for example, the effect of the native language actually becomes more significant. So it's really important in a particular country to develop versions of tests, not only in the majority language, but also in minority languages. We also need to ensure that both the test material and the response mode is suited for the language skills, the level of cognition, and the level of working memory of our participants. And the lesson here is that simplified versions of tests can often be just as sensitive. Um, and also that that open set response mode may have advantages on the closed set response mode that requires you to hunt for options on a screen. Okay, so back to um, our speech test. Now I wanna talk in a little bit more detail about the digit triplet tests that we have developed. Um, so the New Zealand hearing screening test uh, is the name that we give to the, the digit triplet tests that are in New Zealand English and in Te Reo Māori. For those of you who aren't familiar uh, with a digit triplet test cipher, we'll be giving you more information about that later. But just very briefly, um, you hear a set of digits, so three digits presented in background noise. So here it is in New Zealand English, for example. The digits three, nine, one. You enter three, nine, one. And in Te Reo Māori, uh, we've produced Te Whakamātou Tau, Whakarongo o Aotearoa, uh, and this is what you hear. And you enter 095 or Kore Iwa and Rima. And the Te Reo Māori digit triplet test was actually the first that we have, um, that was produced in a non-European indigenous language. Right, so um, Cypher will be talking to you in a bit more detail about the Malay version. Here's a, here's a quick preview. Nombo kosong dua tiga. And you enter kosong dua and tiga. Okay, so as uh, Cypher will explain more this afternoon, the test is an adaptive one. So it uses a simple one up, one down adaptive procedure to find the level uh, of signal to noise ratio at which the person scores 50% when we are scoring at the triplet level. Um, so here's the adaptive track. And what we do is disregard the first seven responses, which is where they're getting down to threshold, 
take the average of the remainder. And you can see here that this participant's score is minus 14 dB signal to noise ratio. So before we go ahead with the testing, we have to ensure that the stimuli are normalized. And by that, we mean that all the digits are equally difficult. Um, and that helps us maximize the sensitivity test, sensitivity of the test, um, and then we can go ahead and validate it. So here are the results for the New Zealand English version. So what you can see here on the x-axis is the mean better ear hearing thresholds between 250 hertz and 8 kilohertz. Those who are at 20 or below on that measure are shown here in green, and those that are above that measure are shown here in red. And on the y-axis, we can see the score that they achieved, the decibel signal to noise ratio, um, for the digit triplet test. And the aim in producing a test like this is to choose a cutoff on the y-axis here it's that black line, which best separates those who we want to pass the test from those who we think should be a refer on the test. And there's a technique um, which is uh, to develop a receiver operating characteristic or ROC curve that you can see here in this panel. Uh, and we wanna be in the top left-hand corner of that of that plot and that indicates that we have high sensitivity and specificity um, and with the particular cutoff for this test we achieve a sensitivity of 94 percent and a specificity of 88 percent so that's great i mean this means the test is is working how well you know, uh, is working really well and um, is separating those people who we should pass the test and those who refer so we have uh, released that test a number of years ago. Um, since 2017, it's been licensed to a private hearing aid um, chain within New Zealand called Triton Hearing. And they have implemented the test on uh, sort of stands that you can see here where we've got an iPad on a screen and a set of headphones. You might be waiting at the pharmacy for your prescription. And in the meantime, you see that over there, the, the test stand, you put the headphones on and you can test your hearing. And so these are through hundreds of pharmacies throughout New Zealand. Um, they also take it on road shows for you know, um, uh, fairs and uh, show days and things like that and set up stands for people to come along and have their hearing testing, tested. So it's proven very popular. Uh, we've also created an online version. Um, it's, it's marketed as the great big hearing check. Um, and um, each year uh, around 10,000 people take that test. So it's, it's you know, getting out there and uh, it's being used really well. Um, we're also trying to get the New Zealand uh, Māori version of the test released as well. So um, in order to do that, obviously, we need to validate it and compare it against people with varying degrees of hearing loss. And uh, one of our students, James Dawson, is undertaking that process this year. So here you can see some Year 10 Māori students who are trying out that test. But... With all of these people taking the test, we have had a chance to look at large numbers of data. And what we find is that even though the test is, is very short, um, when you are testing both ears one at a time, uh, and particularly in the Triton version of the test, they have to uh, enter demographic information such as their name and their email address beforehand so that they can get a copy of the results. The, the, those times add up and what it means is that some people actually just give up during the, the course of the testing. Um, so they'll be in the middle of the test and maybe the, the their prescription will be ready from the pharmacist and they just stop and leave. Or they may get through one ear and then can't be bothered testing the other ear. So they, there's this general feeling that it maybe even though it is short, it's taking too long and some people aren't completing it. So that's obviously a bad screening outcome. If someone is giving up on the test and walking away, that means that uh, we lose them. We don't have their test results. If we can improve the, their stickability, if we can make sure that they hang around and complete the test, then that actually will achieve a better screening outcome. And the way in which we can do that is to make the test more rapid somehow. How can we do this? Well, this has been on my mind uh, for some time. And so uh, in the literature, there are a number of different approaches that um, have been put forward and which are being adopted in various places. So one way you could do this is just to stop the test early. So standard digit triplet tests present 27 sets of triplets. And the reason there are so many is to achieve a high test retest reliability. Some of those have now experimented with using a slightly shorter number. Um, 
But whenever you reduce the number of trials, it usually increases the amount of uncertainty around the result. So having shorter number of trials means we're not as certain of the person's result as we may wish to be, and that has impacts on the sensitivity and specificity of the test. One example um, that I came across was the Royal National Institute for Deaf People in the UK, and they had a version of the digit triplet test available as a, a screening tool on a website. Um, they've since replaced it, but the, this particular version had an interesting quirk when you tried it out. It wasn't a quirk, it was, it was just a, a method of, of giving you a shorter test result. Normally, the test takes um, a number of averages. So if you had poor hearing, it may go out to the full 27 trials. If you had a reasonable amount of hearing, so if you were sort of on the borderline, um, you might stop after 18 trials. But if your hearing was clearly quite good, it might stop after only 10 trials. So it had a, a mechanism built in. Um, so this data you can see here is where I was trying to reverse engineer what was going on. I recorded the, the speech samples and measured their levels and tried to calculate what was what was what algorithm was underlying the test because this this algorithm wasn't published as far as I can tell. Um, but it is clear that you have different stopping points for different degrees of hearing loss. So, so the rationale is, well, if you're down here at this particular signal to noise ratio, you couldn't really achieve that if you had poor hearing, therefore it's safe to stop the test. So um, because again, as it wasn't published, um, the effect that this has on overall test accuracy is unclear, but what, what is visible now if you go to the RNID website is they use a different digit triplet test, so different recording, and it uses the standard protocol of 27 trials. So I'm not sure of the reason for that, but um, they have gone back to, to a more traditional test format. So one thing I mentioned with the matrix sentence test was the difference between the three-word item, uh, three-word sentences and the five-word sentences, and the fact that if we go to five words, we increase the number of scorable items. And that is um, because there's a relationship between the, the number of trials that we take and the, the precision of the estimate. And if we've got more scorable items, we have a more precise estimate of hearing threshold. So typically, the more trials you do in a test, such as 27 trials or cutting it down to 18 or to 10, the more trials we have, we have a greater degree of precision. Um, and the reason for that is that those test retest errors, the way we measure that reliability, they're inversely proportional to the square root of the number of trials. Uh, and as I said, the more scorable items, if we've got a more precise method of estimation, that actually means we, we need fewer trials uh, because we're arriving at a more precise estimate in a shorter space of time. So examples for this are when we're doing CVC word testing, a standard word list, uh, we choose phoneme scoring rather than word scoring because now we've got three scorable items, the consonant, the vowel, and the consonant, rather than just the word as a whole. Um, similarly, if we're doing monosyllables, uh, we have we actually end up with more scorable items if we use a sentence rather than just a single word in our testing. So as I mentioned, typically digit triplet tests are scored at the triplet level. That means you've got to get the whole triplet correct. You've got to get three, whoop, whoop, where are we? three out of the three numbers correct in order for the result of that trial to be a, a correct. So that's a binary classification. It's a zero or a one, correct or incorrect. So even if you get two out of the three digits correct, so the tr you've, you've done that job mainly right, um, that's still a, an incorrect. Why do they do that? Well, the advantage is that it increases the steepness of the psychometric function. And there have been numerous tests that have, uh, uh, studies that have demonstrated that. The standard deviation of the SRT estimate um, is, is reduced when the slope of the psychometric function is steeper. So that's the reason we typically use triplet scoring. And that that is largely been implemented across the board with digit triplet tests. However, periodically people come back and revisit that issue and see if they can um, See if they can improve the functioning of digit triplet tests, making them quicker by increasing the number of scorable items through digit scoring rather than triplet scoring. And the most recent example of this is a, a team from Belgium led by Sam Dennis, uh, who looked at digit scoring for the digit triplet test. So if your score on digits, instead of just a zero or a one, your possible scores could be zero, one out of the three, two out of the three, or three out of the three. Um, 
what they did was vary the step size of that adaptive procedure instead of just two decibel one up one down steps um, they adjusted it to match a specific target on the psychometric function that was similar to the uh, triplet scoring method and what they found interestingly was a higher uh, significantly higher test retest reliability with this method and because of that because of those more more scorable items um, there was no need to change the SRT cutoffs um, but they were able to achieve a 37% reduction in the number of trials while achieving the same test retest error as the triplet scored version. So instead of needing uh, 27 trials to get a result, they were able to stop the test after just 17 trials. And so that's, that's quite, a, um, quite a big improvement there. Um, another way in which you can uh, improve the sensitivity of the digit tri triplet test is by uh, avoiding the need to test both ears individually. So of course you can just deliver the test binaurally to both ears. Um, the danger in those cases is that if you've got a sensory neural hearing impairment in one ear but uh, very good hearing in the other ear, you may still pass the test because it's your good ear that's, that's doing all the work. So to get around that, a lot of digit triplet tests test the right ear and the left ear separately. And of course, testing, performing the test twice takes uh, twice as long. Because it's a speech in noise test, it consists of a speech signal, the digits presented to both ears, and noise that is also presented to both ears. So here you can see the noise, which is at a constant level, and we have the speech signal. This one here says the digits, and then three digits that you can see there. Um, and they are at a variable level, and that's what we're referring to in that adaptive track. So, this signal is presented the same to both ears, but there is another way in which you can improve the sensitivity of the digit triplet test and decrease the test duration. And that is through the use of antiphasic stimuli. So antiphasic means that the, the phase of the waveform is flipped in one ear than the other. And that operates quite differently in the auditory nervous system. Um, and it causes it to stand out from things which are uh, in phase. So here you can see, if we have a look at this time domain waveform here, if you pay attention to the shape of these waves, these are clearly in phase. You can see this rising portion on that last uh, digit there. If we flip the phase of one of those channels, they are now anti-phase. And a funny thing happens when you perform a digit triplet test where the noise is in phase, but the signal is antiphase, and that is displayed here. So here is a standard, a similar to the plot that I showed you for the New Zealand version um, before, where we have normal hearing, uh, people are shown in black, and then various types of hearing impairment are shown there uh, with different colors. So unilateral or symmetric sensory neural hearing impairment, and also conductive hearing impairment. And you get a certain spread, and your task is to draw a line through uh, through that data on the y-axis to, to find a cutoff, which is gonna give you a, a good sensitivity and specificity. And that's shown here as that red dashed uh, curve on the um, ROC curve that you see there. Um, but have a look at the advantage that is given to normal hearing listeners when you present antiphasic stimuli. So look at this, this is the same y-axis. We get a much bigger spread of data. So instead of all being bunched up, the normal hearing listeners come down and we get a spread of hearing impairment um, as, it, as it spreads down there. Um, and this increase, uh, that, that spreading out, increases the separation of normal results from those with unilateral or symmetric sensory neural hearing impairment, or indeed those with conductive hearing losses. So when we look at the, uh, when we um, look at the ROC curve for this antiphasic stimuli, you get the blue line that you see here, and that is much closer to that top left corner. Uh, it, it shows a much more uh, much increased sensitivity and specificity. And again, because we're not testing each ear individually, it has halved the the test time. We only have to perform this test once. Um, and we get excellent results in that way. So that's one approach that is significantly um, improving the performance of the digit triplet test, and it's being implemented um, in a number of different territories, uh, most notably South Africa. All right, so I wanna to talk to you about um, a, a relatively new published method which um, yields vast increases in uh, test speed, and that is to switch from an adaptive digit triplet test 
to one that utilizes a single fixed signal to noise ratio. So as I mentioned, digit triplet tests are adaptive speech tests. They present a number of trials, about 25 to 27 triplets, and you calculate a signal to noise ratio in dB SNR that is for that individual. That's their speech reception threshold for digits in noise. So here you can see we've taken 27 trials to, to achieve the right amount of precision to say, yes, we're confident that that is their specific SRT. And then we compare that SRT to the normative data to decide whether they have passed the test or whether it's a refer. Um, that you can see here. So we, we get a pass result or a refer result depending on whether their SRT is above that uh, signal to noise ratio criterion or below it. So once you've gone through the trouble of um, figuring out what that cutoff should be, once you've established those criterions, uh, it may be possible to improve the efficiency by switching to a fixed signal to noise ratio version of the test. Now, Cass Smits, who was the person to popularize the digit triplet test and release a telephone version of the test in the Netherlands, he uh, released this paper um, uh, a couple of years ago, which proposed a completely different method of hearing screening using digits in noise. So what you, what you can see here is the number of trials that are being presented is on the x-axis on the left-hand panel. Uh, and that straight line is just a one-for-one one line. So this is uh, uh, 5 is 5, 10 is 10, 15 is 15, and so on. And on the right-hand side, you can see for different decibel signal-to-noise ratio um, thresholds. So if you've got a particular SRT, how many trials does it take you? Well, no matter what your threshold, it's going to take you 27 or in, in this particular case, 25 trials to arrive at a decision. So no matter if you've got excellent hearing, really poor hearing or something in between, in the standard adaptive mode, it takes the same number of trials, 25 trials in this case. But what you can also do is calculate um, the cumulative probability that someone is going to pass or going to fail when you present a signal, uh, a single signal to noise ratio um, repeatedly. So what you do is you choose one particular signal to noise ratio that's very near that criterion threshold that we mentioned. And then we keep going until we achieve, uh, until we're 95% certain that that person is gonna fail or pass the test. And so what you end up with is lines that look like this. So as you're going along, um, you present a certain number of trials. And if, for example, when we get to five trials, if you have scored all five of those five trials correctly, then we're, we're more than 95% certain that you will pass the test overall at that criterion signal to noise ratio. And so we can stop the test and say you've passed. Similarly, if we've done those five trials and you got none of them right, then it's we're 95% certain that you are going to fail the, the test. You're gonna get less than 50% at that criterion value. And so we can stop the test at that point and say that you are a refer. So that's, um, that's a clear example there where if your test, if your hearing is very poor, we know after five trials that you're gonna fail the test. If your hearing is very good, we know after five trials that you're gonna pass the test. What about those people in the middle? Well, they have to continue on and we deliver more stimuli. So let's say we get up to 10 stimuli now. After 10 trials, if you've scored eight of those 10 trials correctly, then again, we can stop the test and you have passed. If you've only scored two of them correctly, then again, we can stop the test because we're 95% certain that you would fail. And we can follow the rest of those lines like that. And if we look at the distribution of the number of trials that it takes to make that decision with the a, with a same amount of confidence, um, what we see in modeling is a 67% reduction in the number of trials from 25 to around 8.3 on average. So you can imagine that's a, that's a vast improvement in the... Um, in the speed at which that test was delivered. But how does the sensitivity and specificity um, stack up? Well, actually, the pass and refer, refer, the pass and refer rates for the fixed signal to noise uh, procedure, the very short one, is nearly identical to the one that takes 25 trials, no matter what your um, SRT. So this shows a great 
um, speed advantage for testing. The only downside is that we don't actually end up with that number, which is the person's SRT. So we can't tell by how much they've failed um, or passed. The only, the only information we may have is that they stopped after a short number of trials or a long number of trials. But regardless of that, um, if, if all we're interested in is saying, do you need further diagnostic testing or not, then, uh, then this is a great way of going about that. So yeah, really an, uh, an interesting method and I'd be interested to see if uh, people adopt this on a, on a mass screening scale. Um, we spoke about language and the importance of using a language that is, is correct for the person. So that's why we've got digit triplet tests in all sorts of languages. But another approach is to not use speech at all. And I shouldn't really be talking about this in a speech audiometry um, talk, but um, people have experimented using ecological sounds. So one, um, one test that was uh, implemented in the Netherlands was called the Sound Ear Check, and that's developed as a language-independent automated self-test that's based on recognition of ecological sounds presented in noise. So in, in the presence of background noise, can you tell the difference between a bird chirp and a bell ringing and a telephone and a baby and a, and a piano and a car horn and a, and a cat, for example? Um, how well did it perform? Well, it was actually um, found to be less sensitive, less specific and less reliable than the digit triplet test in its ability to detect mild hearing loss. But if you have to test someone who doesn't speak a language that you have a, a test available in, then this is um, maybe a, an option worth pursuing in the short term. Um, one thing I'd like to talk about now is the use of digit triplet tests with children. So uh, the DTT has been trialed for school age hearing screening in Flemish children, uh, so it's the Flemish speaking region of Belgium, um, in children aged nine to 16. Uh, and those children were previously tested using pure tone hearing screening, but they made the shift to test first with the digit triplet test. And if they fail that test, if they get a refer, then they receive an audiogram. So um, those two different age groups, the fifth grade elementary school and then the third grade secondary school, the older children, they had two different referral criteria, two different um, SNR cutoffs, if you like. Um, so in, in the Flemish speaking population of Belgium, they actually have screening across a wide range of ages. So not only neonatal and preschool, but also that, that school age um, screening that uses the digit triplet test um, and also testing at entry to school, five to six years of age. So that's a very large number of uh, test points for, for hearing screening. They did try to use the digit triplet test for five to six year olds, but it was found to be unreliable. And so they still use pure tone screening for five to six year olds. So why is that? Well, the answer is that if you use a DTT on young children, they have a limited attention span and the test durations actually work out to be quite long. So that's eight minutes for a single ear in a six-year-old. Um, and so they just can't sit through that test. So we could do other measures to reduce the, the, the number of trials, for example, but again, that's gonna reduce the precision of the signal to noise ratio estimate. But one approach that is proving quite successful is gamification of uh, the digit triplet test to increase engagement. So that team of researchers led by um, uh, Astrid van uh, Veringen and Jan Wouters um, have developed uh, what's called the Pirates Game. Uh, and this is a digit triplet test where six-year-old children open pirate chests by entering a three-digit code. So it's like they've got a padlock and they hear, they get told what those magic uh, numbers are for the for the padlock and instead of just pushing the buttons um, they have to choose the right numbers on the padlock and that could open up the the, the treasure chest um, and the results have shown that it, it enhances the children's uh, motivation and is able to sustain their attention such that they're able to complete the digit triplet test and get and get more reliable results um, another approach to gamification has been taken uh, with the Sound Scouts app uh, produced by Carolyn Mee uh, with the collaboration of the National Acoustic Labs in Australia. So here's some screenshots that you can see there. It, it's actually a composite of a number of different listening games, they're calling them, but some are speech and noise and, and um, others aren't. There's a variety of different tasks that they see there. And the aim, again, is to differentiate normal hearing kids from kids with a, a hearing impairment. 
And it's proven so successful that the Australian government has actually just paid for that test to be free for all Australian school uh, school aged children between um, ages four and 17 can download and use this app for free. Uh, people outside that age range or people in other countries uh, pay a small fee, but um, it is it is free across the Australian school age population, which is uh, which is fantastic. So again, it's a, a successful method of testing young children through gamification. So their aims were to produce a game that was engaging and fun for children to play, that detected hearing problems and differentiated between sensory neural hearing loss, conductive hearing loss, and auditory processing disorders. Did they achieve those aims? Well, yes, it was fun and engaging. They didn't measure that uh, specifically, but the anecdotal evidence was that it was fun and engaging for children to play. Did it detect hearing problems? Yes, it did. So if you combine age-adjusted scores from the three tests um, that are part of there, one of those tests is based in speech and quiet, one is based on speech and noise, and the other is based on tones in noise, you can combine those scores to um, produce a composite metric, and that reliably detected children with, with a, a four-frequency average hearing loss that was greater than uh, 30 dBHL in either ear. Did it differentiate between sensory neural conductive hearing losses and APD? Uh, actually, no, it did not. And there's a, a variety of reasons why that may be the case, but further work is indeed in progress. Okay, so what's next for our particular suite of speech tests? Uh, well, we're doing a number of things to ensure that those tests are rapid, accessible, and equitable. So work is indeed continuing. Um, so in terms of improving the speed and sensitivity of our speech tests, we're re-establishing the, the digit triplet test normative data using antiphasic stimuli. Um, that should halve the duration of those tests. How can we improve the accessibility? Well, we're working with a programmer at our university, uh, Robert Fromont, who is um, really fantastic at, at creating web interfaces for things. And we've developed um, web-based delivery formats for both the digit triplet test and the matrix sentence test, which is very exciting for uh, enabling the release of that um, to, to clinicians who may be in hospitals or remote locations who may have a phone or a tablet or a PC. You can use the same test on uh, same test platform on any of those devices. What about ensuring equity? Well, uh, again, with tests in different languages, we're, we're carrying out the validation of the Treo Māori digit triplet test this year, um, working with Indigenous communities to, to, to make sure that we're um, making a test which is suitable for their needs. Um, and we're also next year developing uh, Te Reo Māori matrix sentence tests, both the standard five word version and the simplified version. But I'm going to start with the simplified version, I think, just because we've shown it, it, it is very successful in a, a range of circumstances. Uh, and also, um, as Aza will talk about tomorrow, uh, work with uh, Saiful and Aza on the uh, Malay pediatric matrix sentence test. So I just want to briefly mention um, that this work is, isn't possible without the help of a very, very large number of students and collaborators. If you look down the bottom there, you'll see a, an old photo of, of Seifel, um, who, who worked really diligently on creating the Malay versions of the digit triplet test and the matrix sentence test. Um, so I'd just like to thank uh, a large number of people, um, particularly uh, Seifel, Azza, Nerlin, uh, Sarah Ramat, um, all my collaborators in Malaysia. I really enjoy working with you and, and hope to do so more in the future. So thank you very much.